Oral questions by members? Happy Valentine's Day. I'm sure there will be lots of love exchange in the next, next 30 minutes. <laughs> Member for City South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, there's a massive disconnect between the Premier's rhetoric and actual results when it comes to crime and social disorder. The explosion of violence that began during his time as a soft on crime attorney general continues to wreak havoc in communities. Last month, we've seen example after example. In Burnaby, a woman savagely attacked and left seriously injured on the sidewalk in an unprovoked attack. In New Westminster, a vicious random attack with a stun gun sent a victim to hospital. And in Vancouver, an armed criminal who was on bail tried to enter a bar in, on Granville with a firearm. Prolific offenders continue to be put back into the community to hurt innocent victims. What, is this what people will see and have to experience in their lives every day? And will the Premier end his catch and release system so people can feel safe again? Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I uh, thank the member uh, for uh, her question. And what I can tell the Honourable Member is, is that ever since taking over as Attorney General and then as Premier, our Premier has done an amazing job in terms of bringing forward initiatives that are going to deal with some of the challenges that we're facing in communities. We have seen funding increases now in terms of putting in programs uh, and supports for uh, police and communities to deal with some of the challenges that they're facing with those uh, who are addicted to substances and have mental health issues, for example, so an expansion of the CAR program, uh, the creation of peer-assisted care teams so that they can diffuse situations and not necessarily have a police officer attend a situation whereby a, uh, a, a, a mental health worker may be the more appropriate response, freeing up uh, police to be able to do uh, additional duties on additional work uh, uh, in, in key critical areas around public safety. At the same time, we've made it clear that we want to see changes done at the federal level in terms of the, uh, the bail uh, situation, Honourable Member. Uh, the Attorney General and the Premier have uh, spoken uh, with the Minister of Justice and the Prime Minister on that. Uh, the Federal Justice Minister has indicated a willingness to look at and to make changes to the, uh, to the bail conditions, uh, the, the uh, unintended consequences from uh, Bill uh, 75, Honourable Speaker. There's a significant amount of work being done by the Premier, by this government, on this side of the House to keep our streets safe. Sorry, so supplemental. What's amazing is how this government could have stood by for almost six years now and watched people get randomly attacked on the streets of this province. It's absolutely ridiculous for me to actually hear the words amazing come out of someone in this room's mouth when I know that people have received a pipe to the side of the head, been stabbed in the throat trying to deliver food in Vancouver. You know what? It's results that matter, and it's been announcement after announcement and initiative announcements. And you know what? It's results and what people see that actually matter. Last week, another senior was the victim of a vicious random attack in Chinatown. The offender, Alan Kipson, has a history of assault and failing to appear in court. But despite being found guilty of assault just two months prior, Kipson was allowed back into the community where he went on to viciously attack a 74-year-old woman waiting for a bus. The elderly victim was rushed to the hospital while Kipson walked free. When will the Premier end his catch and release system and put the right of victims to feel safe ahead of a, an offender's right to reoffend? Deputy Premier. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and again, I thank the member for the question, and I will take this opportunity, because she is new in the House, to remind her of the initiatives that this government has undertaken under the six years that we have been in power, Honourable Speaker. <laughs> initiatives... Members, 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 <laughs> members, members, it's Valentine's Day. 
Continue. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. You know, I always find it interesting that uh, whenever I'm about to let them know the facts, they don't want to hear it. They start, they start to get all agitated, Honourable Speaker. And I can understand that. And I can understand that, Honourable Speaker, because when you look the largest single investment in the largest single investment in policing Members. in the history of this province, Honourable Speaker. The largest single investment in policing in the history of this province, which nobody on that side of the House, Honourable Speaker, did when they sat on this side of the House, Honourable Speaker. The Mem first, Members. The first, the first 277. Two, 277 positions to be filled, Honourable Speaker. This government is funding them. On, oh, the member from Camels. I'd like the member from Camels maybe to talk to his colleague from Prince George Mackenzie, who, trialed, who tried to do it but wasn't able to because their budget focused cuts wouldn't allow it, Honourable Speaker. put in place the first witness protection program, Honourable Speaker, made in British Columbia, that's resulted in a significant increase in charges and convictions of people uh, convicted of, 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 of murders and crimes, Honourable Speaker. We brought in place the first forensic firearms to, uh, to crack down on gang activity, Honourable Speaker. All of those initiatives done by this government, 16 years they had to do that, and they failed every single time. Vancouver Langara. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Minister stands in this House talking about the Premier and the Attorney General as he was uh, in his role for five and a half years. He's had six years to fix this. And under his watch, things have only gotten worse in Chinatown and in communities across our province. People do not feel safe on our streets. What people see and feel in Chinatown is how a once thriving community is now plagued by violence and hate. Under this Premier's catch and release system, random attacks continue to escalate, and anti Asian hate crimes are 400% higher than in 2018, according to a recent report to Vancouver City Council. Vancouver has become the anti Asian hate crime capital of North America. Seniors who call Chinatown their home live in constant fear, and it's time for the Premier to start taking some responsibility. After six years of worsening results, when will people see an end to the random attacks, the constant social disorder, and escalating anti-Asian hate crimes in Chinatown? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, everyone deserves to feel safe in their communities, and when we hear about those traumatic acts, we can all stand together here and condemn them. And as a government, we're taking action. Two weeks ago, I met with Minister Lametti to talk about what's at the core of this issue, which is a bail reform policy that needs to be addressed. We had a very productive meeting, and I'm looking forward to changes there. But this government is taking action to keep our communities safe. We issued a new bail directive for repeat violent offending to, to all Crown prosecutors. We're standing up 20 new dedicated Crown prosecutors as, as part of our repeat offenders action team that will focus specifically on repeat violent offenders. We've seen a 32 increase, 32% 32 increase in Crown Council budgets, um, and that's after the opposition starved it for years. This is a government that's committed to taking action to make sure that our communities are safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Vancouver Langara Supplemental. Mr. Speaker, that response from the Attorney General is simply just not good enough for the seniors and the other people living and working on Chinatown who are scared and continue to live and work in fear. This government, this Premier, has had six years to address this. And this Premier's soft on crime approach simply is not working. What people see and feel in Chinatown is how a once thriving community is now plagued by violence and hate. Under this Premier's catch and release system, 
Every day, people are seeing and feeling the evidence that the Premier's catch and release system are a dangerous failure. On the weekend, we saw the Dr. Sen Yat-sen Garden in Chinatown maliciously vandalized and again with fake blood sprayed on its walls. The Garden's Executive Director, Lorraine Lowe, says these unchecked crimes send an unmistakable message of anti-Asian hate. Vandalism in Chinatown has skyrocketed by a staggering 455 per cent since 2019. It's time for this catch and release premier to take responsibility. How much longer must the residents of Chinatown endure these random attacks, rampant social disorder, and escalating hate crimes? Attorney General. Thanks for the question. Um, when we hear about these acts of racism and violent attacks, we all can stand together to condemn them. And, and our heart goes out to the victims. Um, Mr. Speaker, my role as Attorney General is to make sure that the justice system has the tools that it needs to respond. I spoke about our new bail policy and the directives that we're going forward. I spoke about our investment in Crown Counsel and the 21 new dedicated Crown prosecutors that will be focused on repeat violent offence response teams. Everyone agrees this is a national issue. The Premier has written, along with other Premiers, to the federal government to ask for changes to the bail policy will help us put more tools in place for our Crown prosecutors to, to respond to repeat violent offenders. We're going to keep doing the work necessary to help make sure that our communities are safe and to address the challenges that we feel in our we see in our communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Leader, third party. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. During the uh, BC NDP leadership event last fall, um, Premier Eby said, quote, we cannot continue to subsidize fossil fuels and expect clean energy to manifest somehow. We cannot continue to expand fossil fuel infrastructure and hit our climate goals. My question uh, through you, Mr. Speaker, is to the Premier. Will he commit to no new or expanded fossil fuel projects in British Columbia? When we ask questions, the members, no names to be mentioned. Minister for Water, Land and Resource Stewardship. Oh, no, 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 the other one, other one. Energy and Mines. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. I appreciate his interest and his passion for this topic and one that our government shares. We have been very clear all along that all future LNG projects need to fit within our climate commitments. We have said this over and over again. The Premier has backed this up. It has been a strong part of the message from our government. We are going to continue to work with the oil and gas sector to reduce emissions, to fit within our sectoral targets, and to hit those targets. Mr. Speaker, I am so honoured to have this position, to be working with my colleague, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, uh, together to address this. I appreciate the question. Thank you. Member Supplemental. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and apologies. Um, it's the, uh, essentially the same uh, response that the Premier gave uh, us last uh, fall, that we are going to be meeting our 2030 and 2050 targets, and that's the goal of Clean BC. Uh, unfortunately, we're not uh, on track uh, to meet those targets as we uh, currently stand, uh, Mr. Premier, and, or Mr. Speaker. And um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that we've got multiple LNG proposals in this province being speculated upon, many of which are uh, very bullish in their, um, uh, the future of LNG uh, in this province, uh, uh, a response that uh, this government has yet uh, to tamper down. Uh, we've got uh, wood fibre, Tilbury, LNG Canada Phase 2, Cedar LNG, Kasai Lism's LNG, all ready to go uh, in this province, Mr. Speaker. And if they, uh, if they are going to move forward, then it's going to take the clean BC and the rhetoric around it and completely uh, make it meaningless. So my question uh, through you to the Minister of Energy, uh, with all of the uh, speculation about these other LNG projects, uh, does she still believe that we can expand the fossil fuel industry and meet our climate goals? Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. 
I appreciate the member's passion for meeting climate goals, but I simply do not accept a characterization of one of the leading climate plans in North America in a context when other people are doing absolutely nothing as empty rhetoric. It's simply not true. We have a broad series of actions across all sectors that are designed to reduce emissions between now and 2030, now and 2040, now and 2050. We're making progress on them. This is hard work, but we're doing it. It involves meeting with industry, whether it's the oil and gas sector, the pulp and paper sector, the mining sector, and working with them to drive down their emissions. This is not something that can be simply done by an empty statement in this legislature, an empty statement in front of cameras, or a stroke of a pen. This is hard work, and we're taking it on, and that's why we'll continue to work hard with our partners, with our communities, to meet our climate targets, because that's what British Columbians expect. Member for Surrey White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What people see and feel in downtowns across this province are a daily reality of crime and social chaos. This past week in Victoria alone, multiple storefronts had their windows smashed and random acts of vandalism. It's actually gotten to the point where small business owners like Tara from Bag and Shoes are at a tipping point and are looking at leaving downtown for good. And she says, and I quote, broken glass, used needles, human excrement, we seem to be left to our own devices, end quote. My question is a simple one to the Premier. How many small business owners will have to flee before the Premier ends the crime and disorder that we are seeing in all our downtowns across this province? Mm -hmm. Mr. Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And I want to make it clear, this government takes these issues very seriously. That's why we work very closely with local governments on ways in which we can deal with some of the situations that they, have been fi that they find themselves in. And there's a number of reasons, as the member well knows, for the problems that we're seeing. We're seeing it through the toxic drug supply. We're seeing it through the mental health and addiction issues. And we're seeing it through the unintended consequences that have come about because of some of the changes made at the federal level. And what we've made clear is that all levels of government have to be involved. That's why we've been working with local government to identify areas where the province can assist them, whether it's through things such as downtown revitalization, whether it's ensuring that they've got the, uh, the, the, the housing resources that they need, where we've seen some progress being made in a number of areas of communities such as Vancouver and Victoria. At the same time, it's working with communities that recognizes that, that they need additional support in terms of policing. That's why we put in place the surge teams in places like Prince George, in Terrace, in Kamloops, to assist police in doing their job. That's why we've made the largest single investment in terms of policing of the 277 vacancies on the prov provincial police line to ensure that they're able to serve smaller rural communities, which are going to assist as well. But we also need that their changes need to be made at the federal level from the issues that have come around from the, uh, the changes that they made around bail and the court cases that have come from that. All of the. Please I'm continue. trying to give an answer to a question, and what do you do? You get heckled. Anyway, no. anyway, honourable speaker. Members, thank you, honourable speaker. Uh, working with the federal government to make those changes, where the justice minister himself has said British Columbia has been a leader on this issue, honourable speaker. We take it very seriously. We're going to continue taking the actions, working with local government police, the federal government, to deal with the problems of public safety that communities are facing. Member for Kelowna Mission. Thank you so much, Honourable Speaker. You know, I'm sitting here listening to the Minister's response, and I'm just flummoxed by the fact that it's just, in his words, always someone else's fault for this government. It's either the local governments or the business associations or the federal government's fault. But the lip service, the announcements, 
and the long list of rhetoric are not results that are actually experienced by our citizens who are traumatized and fearful by what they see in our streets daily. Kelowna has the highest urban crime rate in Canada. This is what people have experienced in my community just in the last month. A man attacked, left lying on the ground, unconscious and bleeding from his head. Threats and smashed windows from a man with an ax in an unprovoked attack. And last week, a prolific offender who personifies the Premier's catch and release system was back in the news. Tyler Newton, the bus killer with over 50 criminal charges, committed yet another crime after being let out again into our community. When will the catch and release premier prioritize the rights of victims to feel safe over the rights of prolific offenders like Tyler Newton to continue to reoffend? Minister of Public Safety. Thank you, uh, Honourable Speaker, um, and um, thanks to the member for the, uh, the question. And um, I'd like to remind that member that uh, uh, hiring 270 uh, um, new uh, RCMP officers that will assist in rural small communities across this province on the provincial uh, line is not rhetoric, Honourable Speaker, it's action. Expanding, expanding car programs, Honourable Speaker, that local governments have been asking for is not rhetoric, Honourable Speaker, it is action. <laughs> Peer assisted care teams, Honourable Speaker, which have shown huge success on the North Shore and in New Westminster being expanded across this province, Honourable Speaker, to some 20 communities, Honourable Speaker. That's not rhetoric, Honourable Speaker, that's action, Honourable Speaker. <laughs> And unlike Honourable Speaker, the opposition, when they sat on this side of the House and cut victim services programs, we've expanded those programs, Honourable Speaker. That's not rhetoric, that's action, Honourable Speaker. Member for Skina. Mr. Speaker, for years we've been bringing accounts of victims of violence to this legislature and trying to get government to act. Now, we've heard the responses from government, and, and it's, it is rhetoric. We've heard this government blame the federal government, for example. We've, we know that this government downloads responsibility in municipalities yes. and small businesses. We've heard all that. But this is the first time that I heard government get up and say, the work that we've done to protect BC citizens from violence is amazing. That's the first time I've heard that when the amount of attacks are going up in British Columbia. Just take one account of a victim that gets hit in the side of a head and tell them that this government is doing amazing work. People across the province are growing tired of the Premier's excuses amid ongoing crime and social disorder in our communities. A recent rally in Nanaimo saw hundreds of people calling for the Premier to be accountable for his lack of results. This rally happened in January 2023. There was no mention of amazing results. One resident, Karen Kovicha, spoke out about the devastating impact of crime in her community. This is what she's got to say, and I quote, We've already had a loss of life from a robbery that became violent. We've had fires in vacant buildings. We've had a suspected hit and run that took a life. The list goes on and on, and it's only been a week. End quote. A British Columbian citizen is saying this. It's not us, it's not the opposition. My question is to the Premier. When will the Premier put the rights of victims and communities ahead of offenders who repeatedly wreak havoc and terrorize people? Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General. Thank you, Honourable Speaker, and I thank the, uh, the member for uh, his question. Um, it's unfortunate um, that the member seems to characterize the initiatives um, you know, as, uh, that we have undertaken, uh, whether it's 
wanting to get changes made to, uh, to, to bail reform, uh, which the Attorney General, the Premier, had spoken to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Prime Minister about um, as, um, you know, blaming someone. It's not blaming. What it's recognizing is, is that the Fed's made some changes. There were consequences, unintended consequences. They're impacting them. We are working to get those things changed, Honourable Speaker. In the same way, Honourable Speaker, we work with local governments in his community of Terrace, where the RCMP were facing challenges in terms of the resources that we were facing. We put additional resources into his community, into Kamloops, into Prince George. And I can tell you, Honourable Speaker, on my recent trip to Prince George, the police there indicated how pleased they were that we had put those surge teams in because they were proving invaluable. Those are real initiatives, Honourable Speaker. In the same way that the initiatives that we've undertaken in terms of victims, Honourable Speaker, this side of the House has put victims first, Honourable Speaker. That's why we've increased the funding for victim services, Honourable Speaker. Unlike them, we're cut. Finally, Honourable Speaker, we have not blamed local government. We've worked with local government. The, attorney, the, the Premier, when he was Attorney General, was, was asked by local government saying, we're facing some challenges. He asked for additional information. Come, come with us and tell us the, specifically to each community. And mayors did that, Honourable Speaker. And the out, results out of that were the Lepard Report, which has initiated other initiatives in terms of mental health and addictions, additional police resources, Honourable Speaker, all of those things designed to assist communities and help keep our communities safe, Honourable Speaker. Member for Kamloops, North Thompson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, well, the Solicitor General routinely gets up and, and blusters in this house, but he seems to have missed the plot line here. And the sad reality is we're asking questions of actually the third Attorney General that this government has had. And instead of hearing from the Attorney General, we keep hearing from the Solicitor General about policing. The police are just as frustrated as all the people that are getting randomly attacked here, here. in this province. We're not questioning the work of the police forces in this province. We're not questioning their attempts at public safety. They're just as frustrated, frustrated with this Premier's catch and release system that has been initiated over the last six years as he has been the Attorney General and now the Premier. But we don't hear, apparently, this Attorney General is not allowed to answer. House Leader won't let her get up and actually answer questions. Two questions have been answered today out of how many? People deserve to hear answers. That's okay. Wow. Wow. Continue. Yeah, the former attorney generals were allowed to answer it well, Mr. Speaker. They seem to be very sensitive today. Members. Members, wow. let's. Sh 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 both sides. Both sides, calm down. Members, members will come to order now. Both sides. Member will continue. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The House Leader, Government House Leader, seem to have something to work out there. Um, Mr. Speaker, people are being attacked repeatedly in unprovoked events in this province, and this government continues to brush it off as if we're making things up, and that people are actually safer and crime is under control under this Premier's catch and release system. It's simply not factually correct. It's just more and more empty NDP rhetoric and promises. In Nanaimo, small business owners like Jeff Ross say there is just in the last 60 days alone, he's had two break-ins, three vehicle break-ins, two shoplifting events, two store windows being broken, and garbage strewn all over the place. You listen to the Solicitor General, somehow things are okay. Well, here's what the Nanaimo Mayor, Leonard Krogh, said. And imagine, Mr. Speaker, if Mr. Krogh had actually been made the Attorney General, perhaps this province would have been actually safer and he wouldn't have left to go to the Mayor's chair in Nanaimo in the first place. But let's look at what he says at the rally, and I quote, I have called upon the provincial government over and over again to provide the secure and voluntary care people need, end quote. That's one of this government's former MLAs 
who is now the mayor of Nanaimo saying that? Question member. How much more violence and theft and business closures will people have to endure before this soft on Premier actually starts taking meaningful action and ends his catch and release system to make communities safe again? Members, members, it's the government's prerogative, whoever they want to stand up and answer the question. Please, we all know that. Shh. Deputy Premier. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. And, and, and I, I will point out to uh, my colleague across the way uh, um, that um, he said that I said it's okay, uh, that, the, uh, that, that the crime is okay. He said that I said it's okay that all these things are taking place. That is simply not true. Everybody condemns the violence that's taking place, Honourable Speaker. Everybody condemns the violence that's, that's taking place. What, I, what I've said in terms of amazing, we've got an amazing Premier, Honourable Speaker. We absolutely do have an amazing Premier. But let's... But, shh, shh, shh. Members, enough. Please but, continue. But, Honourable Speaker, uh, I listened to the member's question, and nearly all of it related to my ministry, Honourable Speaker. And he specifically accused me of saying something's okay. So you're darn right I'm going to take this opportunity to answer the question, to point out, Honourable Speaker, to point out that they cut victim services, Honourable Speaker, that they failed to add, add additional police resources, Honourable Speaker, to communities such as Prince George and Terrace and Kamloops that were asking for them, Honourable Speaker, that they had 16 years, Honourable Speaker, to try and fill the provincial police line, Honourable Speaker, and they failed to do that. Those are actions, Honourable Speaker, that this side of the House is doing, Honourable Speaker. This side of the House is taking action in terms of working with the federal government to get those changes needed around bail reform, Honourable Speaker. That's why the Federal Justice Minister said that British Columbia is taking a leadership role, Honourable Speaker. We have been working with local government, the City of Vancouver, on putting additional resources into communities, whether it's successful programs that we are piloted on the North Shore, expanding them province-wide, such as peer assisted care teams, or whether it's expanding the CAR program, Honourable Speaker, all of those things are taking place and making sure that victim services get more funding, Honourable Speaker, than ever happened under that side. Thank <laughs> you.